for the Rural Urban Bridge Initiative. Uh, we're, we've been doing these briefings, as many of you know, going back almost two years now. I believe our first one was in April of 2021. And we've had some of the best speakers, thinkers, analysts, and uh, doers in the country on these calls. And today will not disappoint. We are incredibly excited to be joined today by Dan Shea. Um, Dan and I were just chatting for a few minutes. I'm looking forward to his presentation and getting to know him. Know him. Dan grew up in upstate New York. Uh, he has been for the last 10 years, uh, a professor of government at Colby College in Maine. He's had other positions at other colleges. He's, he tells me mostly, mostly rural colleges. And his focus as, a, as both teacher and researcher has been on parties and elections. He's a scholar in that realm. And so with that as background, he has joined forces with Ruby's own Cal Muniz in the writing of an upcoming book called simply The Rural Voter. So we're getting a sneak preview here and we're very, very fortunate to have that today. Um, Dan will speak for about 25 minutes as we usually do in our monthly briefings. And at that point, he'll stop sharing his screen and we will open it up to the Q&A. Let me, let me mention a couple of things. Please, 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 when you are not speaking, mute. So for all of us, <laughs> Dan, that's pretty much everybody. Um, when we go to the Q&A, we would encourage first line of questions being in the chat room. With such a big crowd, right now we're up to 130 participants on today's briefing. It's gonna be challenging to have people speak their questions. So please put your questions in the chat. However, if, if you really, really feel strongly about asking a question, you can do that. And we'll ask you to use the hand raising icon and um, all of us on the call from Ruby, including Jackie, myself, and Cody will be scanning the chat box as well as looking for raised hands and try to include as many of you as possible. So thanks again for joining this month and I'm gonna turn it over to Professor Dan Shea. Well, great, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Anthony. I, I did, just to, just to clarify, I thought you said that I had three hours for today's presentation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I'm pretty revved up about the topic, so we could go on and on, but I will try to keep it to about, about 25 minutes because I'm really looking forward to the Q&A part of it. Um, and I want to hear from you all about this topic. It's fairly new for me, studying rural politics. Uh, let me see if I can get my slide. Um, I'm a parties and election scholar, as Anthony said. Um, I've been doing this for a while. In fact, um, most of my professional career is trying to figure out different electoral coalitions. I, for a long time, I focused on young voters and on civility. Um, I've done a good bit on realignment theory about how these transformations are happening. But at the same time, I do have a bit of a rural connection. There's me and my eight point last year. I know um, any chance I get to show you that. That's my wife and our little sugar house, um, our little camp. So I do have these rural connections. I was thinking this morning, uh, maybe even a little bit more uh, <coughs> than at first blush. You see, I grew up in upstate New York. And after I got a degree in campaign management to be a campaign consultant, I was hired by the speaker of the New York State Assembly, sound quality. Mel Miller to run campaigns upstate. So his lead person was a fellow named of Tony Genovese, and it was Tony's job to win races throughout the state for the Democrats. And he hired, they hired a number of operatives to work, work upstate. I was from upstate, so that made sense. So I was thinking about that this morning and I pulled up a slide about the prospects for Democrats upstate about the time I was doing this, about 1996. So that would be the figure to the left. Okay, so there was a lot of differences between how campaigns were run, how Tony Genovese would run campaigns in New York City. We helped him smooth that out upstate, but there was a chance, there was a possibility. We won a good bit of races. Now what you see to the right is 2020. Things have changed, as you know, dramatic change. 
to what the heck is going on? What's happening? So I've been thinking about this and reading a bit about it on the edges of this, this for some time. As you probably know, one explanation is that it's really just about Trump, right? We didn't really pay attention to some extent to rural America. And you'll see uh, we have a slide to demonstrate this until after 2016. There was this sort of flood of sort of explanations how Donald Trump could have won. And surely it was a, a part of that was the, the rural voter. There's also the composition effect argument. Well, rural Americans are white, they're older, they're more likely to be blue collar, they're conservative. If they're, it's not that they're rural that's changing their vote, it is that they are older and they're white, there's a generational change. We've heard a lot about culture wars out in rural America, economic dislocation, community collapse. And we also hear that the Democrats have abandoned abandon uh, the rural areas. Well, a lot of that doesn't work, or at least it works partially. Just think about it being all Trump, for example. So uh, Nick Jacobs and I, who are uh, my co-author of this book, uh, as you'll hear shortly, we pulled together this massive election data set going back to 1824. So this figure shows us the deviation from the mean vote over time, and the dark line is the rural vote. So you can clearly see that it predates Donald Trump. Something's been going on for the last couple of decades. In fact, we argue in our book that it really begins, and we have evidence to su support that it begins in earnest in 1980. There's a couple different uh, blips, you know, Bill Clinton, for example, in 92. But really, uh, we begin to see this, this movement of rural voters away from the Democratic Party beginning in 1980. So it's not really about Trump. Um, there are state legislative seats as well. You know, how could it be Donald Trump if we're all the way down to the state legislative seats? And we see the same thing in the Senate, right? So simply saying that this change we're seeing as a function of Donald Trump probably doesn't cut doesn't cut it. Another piece of it is what we call the composition effect. Well, isn't it just white voters? Well, here in this table, what we have is white Republicans. This is a figure of white Republicans and their attitudes towards Democrats, rural voters at the bottom. You can see that urban white Republicans have a fairly negative view of Democrats, roughly the 35% on a thermometer scale, but that drops down. This is the same group, same white Republican voters. It drops down to about 15 and 18% for rural voters. So it's not just composition effects. It's not just that there are more white voters in rural America. We've heard a lot about the culture war, right? So we're indebted to Tom Frank for his great book. I mean, I, I love it. I talk about it all the time. We talk about it in the book. You know, the rise of cultural issues, this idea that cultural concerns have displaced economic concerns. Well, that may be true. We have some evidence to suggest there are some cultural policy-based differences but it surely doesn't explain everything. You know, as we all know, Kansas voters had a, had a chance to, to speak to this cultural issue just a, a year ago, and they spoke pretty clearly against what we might have thought, you know, in favor of protecting abortion rights. So, so I'm not so sure that the cultural uh, issue is the, is the quick and, and, and dirty explanation. There's a lot of literature, as you know, there's a lot of works that are emerging on this phenomenon. Um, my co-author and Cal Menace have written a number of really important articles on this, but there are gaps. There are gaps in our understanding. So Nick and I, oh, I should also say, not only are there gaps, but there are also some pragmatic implications that we really need to understand. There's not just the gaps in the literature. Hey, this is a really big, important voting block. So what we have here is the proportion of different groups, their weight in the uh, Republican and Democratic voting coalitions. And you can see that rural voters are really important for Republican voters, so much so they're even more important than we than 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 veteran uh, military veterans, and even more important than young voters for Democrats. So there are some important pragmatic implications. And as somebody who has studied party politics has written a good bit on party dynamics, I'm acutely aware of the dangers of one-partyism. 
acute, acutely aware of what happened in the solid South. I've read V.O. Keys, Southern, Southern, Southern politics. So what is happening in rural America? We need to know, we need to fill in the gaps. So there's Nick. So we launched the uh, Rural Voter Project about two and a half years ago. And there are two key pieces, two essential data pieces. The first is probably, I dare say, I could stand, this could be uh, corrected, one of the largest aggregate election data sets ever created. We go to the county level and we take a look at uh, county election returns uh, at the House and the presidency all the way back to 1824. There are 200,000 uh, cells in that data set. And that helped us, that has helped by, by merging that with other data sets, including census information. It really has helped us understand how, 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 how unique a period we're in. On top of that aggregate data set, we conducted three waves of, uh, uh, of surveys. We talked to over 10,000 rural voters. Uh, we did those uh, over a, a period of time before and after Joe Biden was elected, and we included with that 4,000 non-rural voters. So it's a big undertaking, a big project, and it's led to this book. So let's let's dive into what we find. What I thought I'd do is a sort of central argument, and then we could move to a couple sort of the um, sort of bigger, a few more of the more sexier findings that we find. Fundamentally, the book argues that place is critical for our understanding of rural voters. We need to understand that rural voters are different. They care about their communities. They think about their neighbors. They think about their towns that have value. They feel look, looked down upon and they want to stay rural. Our core argument is that there is a shared destiny, a linked fate destiny among folks in rural America. That is merged by two elements. This shared destiny is a function of two elements. First is group cohesion. That rural Americans feel part of a group, a group based on place. Many Americans feel tightly connected to and feel a shared fate to a group, but we would argue only rural Americans place uh, put place at the center of that identity. There is this notion that as my community goes, as my rural community goes, so go I. So there is this filter of politics through a sense of place. And this is unique. And it helps us understand really the radical change that we've seen, the dramatic change we've seen. We cannot explain the changes that you all know about, that we've all, we've all read about. We cannot explain those changes by some people moving in and others moving out or generational turnover. Something else has happened. It's not a change of place, but it is actually what we call a change of heart. And that change of heart, we would argue, is centered on a group identity and a sense of place. Place is central. Uh, we move through the book, various chapters on economic issues, um, cultural issues, community engagement. We obviously take a look at race and cosmopolitanism, and we think we have some novel findings in each of those areas, each of those uh, each of those chapters, really different. For example, uh, in the economic chapter, we show that rural communities are more egalitarian. They're more economically integrated. In the cultural uh, uh, um, uh, chapter, we take a look at policy-based differences, and we only find modest differences on a number of policy questions, with the exception of guns, which we could uh, feel free to talk about that, the relationship between gun, gun control, gun ownership, and a sense of place has become very powerful. In the community engagement chapter, we note that, and I'll, I'll give you a couple of highlights on that in a second, um, there's not a lot, of, a lot of evidence to suggest that rural communities are withering away, that there's less and less social capital. And the, with regard to racial and cosmopolitanism, we find that rural communities, um, members of rural communities uh, link attitudes towards race and immigration to notions of hard work and meritocracy. Let's get into a couple uh, of these more sort of, of bigger findings. We'll parse out a few. <clears throat> 
Um, maybe some of you have seen this. It's not our data, but it's an interesting little finding that we have. That is, um, the question is, can only truly conservatives win in rural areas? Well, that's not the case. But what you'll see here is we've got along this dimension, we have uh, ideology. These are ADA scores from members of Congress. So this is ideology. Obviously, uh, the black dots on the bottom would be the liberal uh, members, progressive members of Congress. And to the right, the other dimension, on the X dimension, we have ruralness. So what we find is that as you move, as members of Congress, Democrats move out into more rural districts, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're much more conservative. And the same is true for Republicans. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're more conservative. Um, yeah, it's above the line, but so are a lot of Democrats that are in urban areas as well. By the way, that's Nick and I have figured out that that's our member of Congress, Jared Golden. Speaking of the sort of the policy and ideological piece, we pull it all together in the end and we create this predictive model of what are some of the factors that are more likely to predict someone's ruralness. Um, we see that civic pride is important. We see that um, place-based grievance and economic anxiety as it relates to the broader community are critically important. But some of the other issues, um, including racial resentment, uh, don't emerge when we add them all together in this composite model. Are rural areas a wastelands of alienation? Uh, Tim Carney wrote this great book. Uh, I think it's called Alienated. I, it's, a, it's a great book, but he argues that the core problem that rural communities face is the withering of social capital, the withering of connectedness. And what we find is, lo and behold, it is true that there are fewer opportunities for rural Americans to engage in civic activities, uh, but not dramatically so compared to suburban areas. So they do gather less with friends. Uh, they're less likely to attend celebrations, community celebrations, participate in groups than urban Americans. We think that that's, that's a sort of an institutional sort of proximity explanation, but not dramatically so compared to rural Americans. How about this question? So um, at the top, what we ask is, uh, are you sure that your community is going to be a better place to live? I am sure my community is going to be a better place to live in five years. And sure enough, there are fewer rural Americans are willing to say that. So they think things might be tough. But here's what's interesting. If given a chance to move away, only 21% of rural Americans said that they would. So even though they think it's, there's a tough road ahead, they don't want to leave. We asked an open-ended questions on one of the waves. We said, describe your community. And then we had poor college students. Uh, don't worry, it was in the winter and it was, I'm sorry, it was in the summer. It was beautiful. Uh, code, uh, thousands and thousands of open-ended questions. And what we find is that rural Americans are much more likely to use positive adjectives to describe their community in positive ways than our urban or uh, suburban uh, respondents. Let's talk a little bit about uh, depictions of rural Americans, one of the interesting findings of the book. Uh, uh, depictions of rural Americans in both popular culture and in the news. Let's start with this figure, and this is obviously the shrinking proportion of the American public that is in rural areas. Uh, the book charts what we would call the pastoral tradition around the turn of the century. A lot of literature, a lot of plays um, portrayed rural America as a place of refuge. Obviously, during the Industrial Revolution and waves of immigration, there's this nostalgia for, quite frankly, traditional white America. But by, uh, by the sort of uh, um, uh, post-1960s, when the proportion of rural Americans drops dramatically in the post-World War II period, we get a different perspective in popular culture. It is that rural Americans are backward and odd, and they become, rural America becomes a gag. 
I was explaining to my students, many of you remember Beverly Hillbillies, it's really quite, quite something, um, uh, quite a, a really tough portrayal of, uh, of rural Americans there. Somehow um, in post-World War II America, there are still people that are using Civil War muskets to shoot at rabbits to eat in, in the hills of Appalachia. And of course, as Jed shoots at a rabbit, misses, and oil starts spilling from the ground, they move to Beverly Hills. They don't quite get it. They don't quite uh, are able to figure out what, what the rest is like. It is a big, ongoing, very popular gag. There is an ugly turn in popular culture. Um, Deliverance is a widely popular movie in 1974, is uh, nominated for an Academy Award. It's the fourth largest grossing uh, film that year. Its portrayal of Appalachia, of Southern rural life, is really, really difficult to watch. You know, from that, that scene of the, the children of, of incest on the porch, they're somehow able to play a banjo, to the, uh, to the infamous rape scene that happens later on. Uh, as been said, this, that this film was probably the most influential film of the modern era in shaping national perceptions of rural life. We get shortly after that, by the 1990s and on, we get the backwater, uh, the backwater outlaw and the rural monster. I asked my students, can you think of a horror film that isn't set in rural America. And none of them could come up with one. From the Texas Chainsaw Massacre to the Blair Witch Project and Halloween, of course, Stephen King, Maine's own Stephen King and Cujo, right? So it is to be feared. It, it, this is where we find the villains in America. By about a decade ago, maybe, Maybe maybe 15 years ago or so, we get the reality shows. We get the rural reality shows. By our count, there were some 127 rural reality shows in 2016, from Axemen to Ice Road Loggers, um, Redneck Family, Honey Boo Boo, Buck Wild. My one of my colleagues just came in and said, "You got it. You got to show some pictures of Buck Wild. I've not seen it." This is Shelby from Swamp People. Somehow uh, he still drives to town uh, in his tractor to get his mail all along, shooting his pistol randomly into the air. So we get these re reality shows that are actually not uh, based on reality, of course. More recently, we see a series of films, a series of shows that depict rural community as backward and quirky, but maybe lovable, right? So all my students know Schitt's Creek, right? So in the hard to understand these rural folks, but in the end, if you can cut through their, their simplicity and their quirkiness and their simple-mindedness, there's sort of a, there's something lovable about them. Now this one, um, Yellowstone, I, I'm I'm open to thoughts on this. I thought maybe you could help me on this. I've not seen too many. Is that apparently um, we've got to dive into in our discussion. We've got a few more weeks before the final manuscript is done. Love to have your thoughts on how Yellowstone complements the story of the portrayal of rural life, rural America. Obviously, there's a profound sense. I've seen a few episodes uh, linked to place. Uh, an identity linked to place. Um, so open to discussion on that. In the end, by the 1980s, rural residents are scary, backward, quirky, crude, violent, promiscuous, wild, destined to fall behind if not saved by the rest of us. We asked residents, I'm sorry, we asked respondents about this. We asked, how do you think Hollywood does in portraying people that live in the place where you live. So we asked urban re respondents, how does popular media portray urban life, suburban, rural life? Now, what we find is what's critical down here, right? The question is, how often do they get it right? For urban Americans, it's over 50% think they get it right. 
either most of the time or always. That's only about 25% over here to the right for, for rural Americans. And they know that, they understand that. Let's switch for a second to the depictions of, uh, of rural life in the news media. Are rural Americans um, just crazy? Are they just wild lunatics? This is a picture of a place in Pennsylvania called the Trump House. Uh, a reporter for Politico went to get a story on rural attitudes and the 2020 election, and he started the story from the Trump House. So Nick and I were wondering about this, wondering about these sort of recurrent portrayals of rural Americans as overboard, as crazy, as really out there um, on the edge. And it conflicts with a lot of the data that we have, and it conflicts with our lives as rural residents. We see some of this, of course, but not all the time. So what's happening? And this is what we did. We divided the sample between those who are deeply engaged and those who are not. What we did was we took two variables. We asked respondents if they had posted anything about politics in the last 24 hours, and we took the highest measure on a self measure of engagement, a four point measure, how engaged are you in politics? So we took those at the top of that, the ones that said the highest level. And we do, and then we introduce that to our data. I can tell you, jumping ahead, we cannot think of, we cannot find two other variables that more neatly divide our sample than those two. Now, there are some issues related to age, for example. Of the deeply engaged are not as old. They're much more likely to be male, a little bit more conservative, a little bit more likely to have a college degree. Um, actually less likely to own a gun, um, much more likely to attend church um, and feel resentment towards uh, city life. But here's the, here are the big ones. We asked whether or not the respondents thought it was okay to hurl insults at politicians. The non-engaged rural respondents, the non-deeply engaged only 12.7% said yes. That triples to 54.6%. We asked this question about whether or not women are too easily offended by things these days. It goes from 49 to 64. There's the racial dimension. There's the Latino question. Americans should always love their, their, their country. It goes from 45 to 60%. It is it okay to ignore political correctness? It goes from 20 to almost 50%. What's happening out there? Who are these folks? They come together twice as often with friends in their community. They're twice more, almost three times more likely to have worn a Trump hat, to flew, flew a Trump flag, and to attend rallies. We call this group the rabble rouser, the rural rabble rouser. And what we find, if we take a look at conspiracy theories, what we find is that at the top, we have rural residents who would not fall into that deeply engaged. And by the way, I, I should have mentioned, only about 10% of rural respondents are deeply engaged. That's, a, that's an omission, I, I, I should have told you that. Only about 10%. So the other 90% are as about on average, maybe even less likely to believe in conspiracy theories as the average voter. But for the rural rabble rouser, it's through the roof. So what we argue is that there is a group of rural Americans that have defined their identity, have defined their, their place in their community through politics, through overt, loud expressions of their support for Donald Trump, for Republicans, for opposition to Democrats. But why do we see that? Why, why do we not fully understand that this is only a small piece of rural America? 
Well, we thought about that. We got a little bit of data on this real quick story, an NPR story. So there was an NPR story in, in the fall of 2002 in Wisconsin. And the reporter wanted to find out what was on the minds of rural voters. So she went to uh, Sheboygan. He went to Sheboygan, um, Wisconsin to find out what was happening. And lo and behold, she tells us, he tells us in this story that he can't find anybody to talk to. Nobody's around. I think the, the Packers were on TV or something. And then she came to a house that was littered with Republican yard signs, filled with it. And she knocked on the door and they invited her in. And she proceeded to do her interview about what rural Americans were thinking about the upcoming election. We tried to put a little bit of data to this and what we find, so this is a content analysis of the 50 uh, largest uh, news outlets in America uh, for mentions of a rural voter. So how often did these outlets mention a rural voter? So the first thing we can see is not a heck of a lot prior to 2016. So there's this big, there's this big jump, uh, which we understand, right? This is uh, J.D. Vance uh, and, and Kathy Kramer, to some extent, they're telling us that something's happening in rural America. So uh, news outlets are sending the reporters to figure out what's going on in rural America. And we see that there. Now, this is this another jump is the pandemic. Right. So we get these stories that there are there is tremendous vaccine hesitancy in rural America. There is rejection of social distancing and all these sort of COVID precautions. So maybe it makes sense that we see yet again this rise in uh, in stories about the rural voter. Well, we took a look at this, and there is a number of studies, including one by the Pew Research Center, that shows that rural Americans are only slightly more likely to reject vaccines than are the rest of Americans. There's only about a 5% gap. There's only about a 5% difference. Farther to the right, we get another hit right, right in here, and that is the Capitol riot. So, of course, because there is this riot on January 6th, Surely it must be in part rural voters coming into town to take care of business. But as you probably already know, there is no, there was no demographic or geographic bias on uh, the, the who was participating in the riots on January 6th. Rural America had about has about 20% of rural America, about 20% of the rioters were at the Capitol on that day. So how does this happen? We think it happens because of three uh, things, three Ds, uh, the dramatic cells, right? Um, you show a picture of the Trump, um, the, the, the Trump house, you're going to get, um, you're going to get a lot of clicks. The demographics of reporters, there are fewer and fewer reporters that are from rural America. And of course, the decline of local news and the decline of rural news we spend a good bit of time talking about this crisis and local reporting. And here's the catch. Here's the catch. And you know, many of you know about this story of the decline of local news. Even where there are um, bureaus, there are outlets that cover rural parts of states or parts of America, the reporters are often not there. They're not embedded, we might say, in rural communities. They have to drive, they have to go get the story. And when they do that, they get, they're overworked. It's, 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 it's a tough job. They go and they get the dramatic, they get what's there. They drive right to the Trump house and they get their story. They knock on the door and they talk to the, to the, the, to the people that have all the signs. So what? So let me pull it all together. Um, yes, we say that there is an, an important uh, urban rural, rural divide, but what that means depends on perceptions, right? Depends on the perceptions of how they're different, right? Knee-jerk assessments that is just Trump or that's just cultural uh, forces or economic dislocation um, help pushes us to overlook common problems, problems felt by, by non-rural Americans as well. 
This problem that we're confronting leads to one party dominance in rural areas. There is a representation gap between what rural vo voters want and what they get. We could talk about primary elections if you'd like. And uh, it, it, not understanding what's really happening neglects attitudes about from rural Americans, attitudes and perspectives that we should know, that we should understand. We offer some recommendations in the end. It is not a book about prescriptions. We talk about institutions, including higher education. We'd say it's quite interesting that there are a number of uh, urban uh, metropolitan classes on urban politics and metropolitan politics, but very few on rural politics. Um, we make recommendations about uh, to the news media about better understanding who really vo rural voters really are. We're going to talk a little bit about the creators of popular culture. You know, it's it, uh, it, it's amazing how uh, this is a, a group of folks that want really badly to um, to make sure not to promote stereotypes and tropes, but somehow rural Americans still seem fair game. Um, we have recommendations for politicians and Democrats. With regard to Democrats, we end the book by saying, first, show up. You got to show up. Don't see the election before it begins. Don't assume that there is no path to victory. If you can demonstrate a genuine connection to the district, the deeper the roots, the less skepticism. So we have uh, north of us, just here in the second district of Maine, we have a Democrat in the red district. His name is Jared Golden. Boy, he's got deep roots to that community. He's got deep roots to that community. And we think that helps. Right. Appreciate the power of place. Lean into being a resident. Don't shy away from liberal policies, but help rural voters see how these policies impact them. Finally, what we'd call home style, which is matching your, your, your communication, your style, your approach that fits and resonates with rural voters. There are too many examples, we argue, of rural Democrats who are able to make these connections. And we talk about, you know, Tester, we talk about Golden, uh, Tim Ryan, we spend a good bit of time talking about Tim Ryan. Okay, he didn't win in Ohio, but he did much better than Joe Biden did. He didn't shy away from liberal policies, for example, but he helped the voters of Ohio better understand those policies. So thank you for listening. Um, um, I really appreciate it. I would... Um, accept uh, obviously questions and comments and please send me an email or drop me a call if we're not able to get to some of that. So Anthony, I hope that was in 25 minutes. Um, I sure raced through it. Anthony, you're still on mute. Ari, thanks. Dan, if you would just unshare your screen and then we'll switch over to just the gallery view of everybody. I'm going to go ahead. Thank you very much for that incredibly rich and full presentation. I want to start with a couple of questions that came up about your book. Um, the first was, when does it come out? And the second is, does your look at rural encompass Native American communities, which are obviously frequently substantially rural. Yes. Well, the first part, um, it comes out hopefully in October. So it's moving into production. It takes a little while with university presses, October or November, um, well ahead of uh, 2024, which is what we want. We do spend some time with Native Americans, but in all honesty, not, not an excessive lot. We don't have as many as we would like in our sample. We do talk about it in, through the uh, aggregate data set, but uh, um, the, the cell, the number of respondents that are uh, on Native American reservations is, is smaller than we'd like. Okay, so you can't tease out like results specific to uh, Native rural communities. Yeah, well, we took a stab at some of that and we felt yeah. a little hesitant about presenting some of that in our books in our book because um, the significance levels aren't very high because we're only talking a, a few dozen, to be honest. Okay, all right, thank you. Uh, there's a question about gerrymandering. At the beginning, you kind of ticked off uh, many of the sort of partial explanations or explanations that in some cases just don't really add up. 
Um, you didn't mention anything about gerrymandering, which we all talk about a lot. Maybe that was beyond the scope of the research, but where do you think that fits in? Well, I'm, it, it matters, I think, probably at the state legislative level a little bit more than at the congressional level. You have to remember, we're, we're taking a look at counties over time, and county borders essentially don't change. So if we can show, which we showed early in that presentation, this dramatic shift that we've seen away from the Democratic Party at the county level, that really tells us it's happening regardless of the shape of congressional districts. Now, is it fair to say that um, congressional districts are shaped in ways that maximize Republican strength? Absolutely. But a good number of books have argued that that's kind of the Democrats' fault, right? That is to say, Democrats are congregated in urban areas to a great degree, right? So as, as Republicans now sort of control uh, rural areas, the Democrats are densely connected. Riordan's Why Cities Lose book uh, makes this argument that the gerrymandering issue is as much a function as of Democrats clustering in cities as it is um, a sort of nefarious gerrymandering schemes. Yeah, yeah, I've, I've heard some of those arguments. I, I, my conclusion is it's, it's some of both, but yeah. <laughs> that's the uneducated opinion. Eric has a couple of questions, a, a little different. First is again about uh, the book, I guess, or really the data set. He asks if the data set, uh, the people you spoke with and interviewed, are they just from New York or does it include people from across the country, the Midwest, the Heartland, the Southeast, the Southwest, et cetera? Yes, 10,000 um, from across the country. The geographic balance is good. Yep, okay. We've got a figure that, that pretty well matches the population. Yep. Excellent, great. And then his other question was about um, sort of the products primarily, I think he's talking about maybe the products and services that are being made available to rural people. He, he cites, I don't know if Eric is talking about sort of a progression here, but in the past, Sears, JCPenney, Montgomery Wards, now Walmart, Family Dollar, um, the, you know, sort of a shift in the type and quality of goods offered to rural people. Do you think that has any impact at all in shaping perceptions in shaping um, either either anger responses or positive responses? Well, I think the probably the closest link I would draw to that is trade policies and NAFTA, right? So it's a it's a myth that rural Americans, as you all know, that rural Americans are sort of comprised of farms, right? A great deal of rural America is manufacturing, particularly in the South. So in the Clinton years with NAFTA and changing trade policies since then, there's been a decline in uh, manufacturing in rural areas. Now, the other side of that is we get real cheap products at Walmart, right? And there's actually an interesting argument that you could make about the democratization of goods because of access to places like Walmart. But one thing's for sure is that a lot of these factories throughout the state of Maine, through Waterville, through Millinocket, Maine, places we talk about in the book, um, lose good manufacturing jobs because of these trade policies. And they hit all of America, but particularly rural America. So that's probably the connection I would make to the Walmart shift. Uh, I would tie it back to the trade policies in the 1990s. Thank you. Um, AJ asks if the rural people today, the people that you surveyed and interviewed, aren't just the people that haven't already moved away. Um, I'm gonna throw in a quick commentary on that. There's a phenomenon in Appalachia, at least, of a pretty regular return of people who did have to move away for work, but now in their 40s or 50s, or sometimes even their late 20s and 30s, are coming back, often because they have so deeply missed the home place or or what you know that sense of place that you talk about so from my perspective even the people who moved away often long to be back to their rural roots but i'm wondering if you'll comment i think aj maybe is asking the question do people love their place because the only people left are the ones that love their place uh i don't think so i, I think 
moving is pretty hard, right? Um, it's not as if, well, you know, I've just, you know, I could move, but I won't. Um, I think moving is 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 pretty hard to do. Um, and the data is is really not sort of nip and tuck. It's it's pretty clear that that rural Americans and through a number of different measures, not just would you move away, but a sense of community and place. We we measure this through five or eight different ways. They have a sense of belonging there. Now, what I will say what's interesting about it, about this moving away is when we ask whether or not their children would be better off if they moved away, they often say yes. They'll, they'll, they'll often say yes. And I think that's bound with this anger and this resentment about what's happening to their rural world. We love it so much um, that, that we want to stay here. But, but because of other things happening, our kids really need to move away. Uh, and that must be that must be heartbreaking for a lot of lot of residents that the best thing for their kid would be to loop, to move away, but but I I don't think it's just a function of those that are left are happy there. Okay, all right. And I, I think you're also right, Anthony. There's a slight as you might, I might know there's a slight uptick in the number of rural Americans on the 2020 census, just a couple yeah. percent points. Yeah, I, I think there is a return phenomenon. Um, just FYI for you, Dan Dylan points out the name of an urban-based horror film, which is Candyman. So you better, ah, you better yeah, right. check that out. I'm actually going to write that down. Candyman. I'm not much of a horror film guy myself, but we'll definitely take Dylan's. Well, this is this is the second presentation, and okay, we got one film. Okay. <laughs> um, he also, Dylan also says that, uh, I think this is a question about your chart, Midway, that asked the question about whether or not it was okay to hurl insults. Can you can you explain that a little bit more about both? It wasn't, you're not saying it's okay to hurl insults, but but how was the question framed and how did the responses break out? I think it was between the not engaged and the very engaged. Yeah, well, that's, we asked a couple different measures about, they're related to civility. So we wanna know, um, takes on sort of acceptable norms of behavior. So the question is, I don't have it at, at the tip of my tongue exactly what it is, but when it comes to political activity or political action, is it okay to hurl insults at politicians? Do you agree or, or disagree with that statement? So only about 20% uh, of the non-deeply engaged agree with that. So these are the folks that are not posting all day and so forth. Only about 20% agree with that. I, I wish it was lower than that, but 20%, right? But for those that are deeply engaged, it zips up to like 60%. So more than half think, yeah, it's okay. It's okay to do that, to, 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 to break that norm of sort of civil political behavior, to hurl insults. And this says to us that this is an animated group I, and I know I was cruising through that section real fast, but I think what it tells us is that there is a group of rural Americans that make up far less than a majority that are grabbing all the attention in the media. The stories are about them. They are the ones that are disrupting the meeting. So I went to, went to a town hall, Mount Vernon town hall meeting not too long ago, and it was dominated by just a couple men that had this information about, about solar farms. We're doing some sort of expansion of solar in Maine. And boy, it was something. And they held the floor for a long time. So any reporter coming into that say, ah, that's what rural, but you know, a whole bunch of other people, there was a hundred other rural Americans that, that were waiting their turn, that were anxious to be respectful. That's what we were getting at. And you said that that deeply engaged group, the rabble rousers, you ended up calling them, only yep. is about 10% overall Correct. rural? That's right. Okay, yeah. And yet I would guess that most Democrats, most liberals, most urban people think they're 75 or 80% of rural. That's, that's right. So what we say, why not? Why wouldn't you think that? You take a drive in the countryside and you see the barns. You see the, the posters, you see the yard signs, right? You see this, literally, there's one in Mount Vernon, there's a carved statue to Donald Trump. 
That's what rural America is all about. Reporters go out and grab that story. Our data tells us that that's not what rural America is all about. Okay. Jenna is asking about grievance. And specifically, uh, Jenna says that uh, at least some of that grievance she feels is towards newcomers to the area. So you have kind of locals, and as we say around here, come tos. And those come tos are bringing different ideas and whatnot, and that uh, people don't receive them well and get have grievance because they want things to be the same and they don't like these new ideas, whatever. Did you find evidence for that, or do you? What do you think about that? Yes, we did. There, there is evidence to suggest that, and, and, and you know, just to sort of anecdotally here in Maine, there's a debate going on right now in the state of Maine. The license plates say vacation land, and boy, there's a lot of backlash against that. So why should we be the playground for the rich Bostonians that want to come up, right? There's backlash against the skyrocketing housing costs. Uh, along the coast after the pandemic, in particular, with new waves of people moving in. So I, we, we find evidence that they think it's a disruption of traditional rural culture attitudes and beliefs, right? And we could talk about gun control, gun, gun, gun ownership, if, if you'd like there. Um, and it is also uh, changing uh, some of the sort of economic issues, particularly the housing costs. The, the, the large tracts of property that are being bought up by folks that often don't live there. Uh, there is some of that anger and resentment happening in rural America as well. Um, I don't know if some of you, Cal has told me a little bit about what's happening in Montana, right, with sort of the moving in of the, the, the folks in, in, in from California and other parts. Yeah, it's happening. Yeah. And of course, again, my, my two cents on it would be that some of that depends on how the newcomers come in. You know, if, if you come in with very different culture and very different language and, and a lot of presumptions that you kind of know what's what's right and what's innovative, you might be received a little differently than if you kind of come in as a listener, as a learner, as a little more gracefully. Anyway, it's it's not my show, so I won't spend too much time no, on it. That's very helpful. I think that's good. Um, some Some other questions were about specific issues in your study whether you tested, you know, differences, um, either, I, I presumably either between rural and urban suburban, or maybe between the two groups of rural, um, they included, I'm looking back now, they included uh, vaccination, you know, you did mention the vaccination rates were not significantly different. Did you, do you see much difference in attitudes, I guess, about that, or beliefs, confidence? Um, another one about the 2020 election and the, the so-called stolen election. Um, there was one more, I'll try to find it, but in, anything in there cover your, covered by your survey? Well, here's the thing on met most of these issues is do we see a difference between rural Americans and the rest of Americans, non-rural Americans? Absolutely. We absolutely do on a number of these issues over and over and over. But here's the catch. Is it a function of these folks being rural or being conservative Republicans? So often throughout the book, what we do is we look at rural Republican attitudes, juxtapose non-rural Republican attitudes. And what we find is very often it's about the same. Very often it's about the same. So is it, 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 are Republicans more conservative? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there tends to be a lot of, obviously, a lot of conservatives in rural America. But is there anything distinctive on these policy questions in rural America? And we don't find that, we don't find anything large. There are a few sort of places where it bops up. The gun issue is, is really something um, it is not, gun control is not a popular position in rural America. It's probably the, the most significant difference between urban, suburban Republicans and rural Republicans is on the issue of gun ownership. I'm convinced that's because it's linked to uh, culture. It's linked to heritage. Um, it is closely bound with what they see as their traditional rural life. Again, a quick local anecdote. 
Our governor is a Democrat. She's term limited. This is her last, this is her last uh, term. She's progressive on many, many policy questions. Um, recently, she was pushed by some progressive members of the state legislature from Portland to do something about gun control. We have one of the most uh, most lax states on gun control. The governor said, "Abs, just not, I'm not going to do it." This is a liberal Democrat. It helps explain why Bernie Sanders would would would, would you know would, does not have a stellar record on gun control either. So back to your the key question there, Anthony. Um, the question, the issue is, do we see dramatic differences between rural and non-rural Republicans? Not so much. Okay. Here, here, let me just finish it by saying the division that we see, the division that we find, is in large measure not a function of policy differences. Okay. Well, we're, we're almost out of time. Dan, if you're willing to go a few extra minutes, there's no way we're gonna get through all of the questions, but I'm gonna rattle off a few more. Uh, maybe we can go to 435 if you're okay with that. And um, then uh, Dan, you've invited people to reach out to you. Is that right? I did. Yes. Yeah, excellent. And, and you can also um, reach out to Dan through Ruby if you want. So here's the next one. You talked about how rural uh, folks are perceived. And then the question that David's asking is, is there any data on how rural folks perceive urban folks? Uh, we actually asked, and I don't have it on that in, in that slide show, that PowerPoint, we actually did ask rural voters the extent to which they thought urban Americans were portrayed accurately in the media. And it's a bit muddled. Um, nothing jumps out. Nothing jumps out. You know, we we do know um, it, we're not saying that Hollywood portrays urban life accurately either, right? You know, if you've seen Law and Order, I mean, it's, you know, we're you know, it's, we're, you know, I'm sure someone could write write a, write a, write a book about about the portrayal of, of urban life as well. But we will make a pretty strong argument that the, Hollywood has rural America wrong. Yeah, yeah, I think you probably could. Um, so two more questions here. Uh, one from Sherry about how you define rural. And that's probably something you can do fairly precisely. And then the next one from Karen and Bruce is, do you think rural voters themselves think they're different from urban dwellers? So first, yes. what's, what's rural and then do they see themselves? Okay, so with regard to how we define rural, we're very careful in the aggregate measure to drop all the way down to the census block. We do not use things like population density of a county. It, it, it's a bit complicated, but we, we, we take things all, all the way down to the smallest census measure, and we do a calculation of the county uh, based upon the number of rural census blocks. That's for the aggregate measure. For the individual measure for the survey, we ask respondents themselves, do you consider yourself rural? We ask it a couple different ways. And what we find is that there's uh, a correlation that really quite high. There are some respondents that think they're, they live in rural areas and it's kind of the census says they don't, but very few. There's a sort of a 95% overlap between what people say where they live and what we're finding in the census. Okay, thank you. A couple of people have commented about media uh, and that was um, around the issue of what one person asked do you, how important do you think Fox News is? And, and do most rural people get their news from Fox? Yeah. And then another person has said, you know, what about the question of the loss of local news, the closing of yes. so many papers or, or the consolidation of small media into giant corporate media that no longer produce local media? What, what do you think the two, yeah. those two? Well, back to, so are rural Americans getting their news from Fox? Yes, they are. Ab absolutely. Um, but here's the question. Um, are are, are urban Republicans getting their news from Fox? Yes, they are. Yes, they are. You know, there's the, the, the guy sitting in Staten Island uh, paying attention to the news. He's getting it from Fox. So are we seeing any dramatic differences between non-rural uh, Americans, Republicans, and rural Republicans? Not really on the news continent. Actually, a little bit less on, on Fox News. What we do find is, 
among the rabble rousers is they're more likely to say they get news from multiple sources multiple sources, which is interesting, which makes us think that they're they're diving into internet-based and radio programs and television, uh, YouTube-based news programs. Um, and the last question was about um, the decline of local news. Absolutely. We spend a lot of time talking about the nationalization of politics. We're convinced that that's a key part of what's happening in rural America, where there used to be a focus on a, a on a community or on a state or on a region. Rural Americans are bound together through through the news they watch, right? Through the news they watch. This nationalization of news. In my other life, I wrote about the decline of civility. I think that's very much linked to the decline of of local news. It used to be that. If you focused on local news, you understood that the person on the other side, the Democrat, you might disagree on something, but hey, our kids go to, to hockey together. We put, you know, we, we know that's all gone, right? So it's easy to vilify the other side when politics is national. 100%. Um, I'm going to also, I'm looking for one or two more questions because we're already a bit over time, but I'll also invite my colleagues to jump in here if they've seen some questions that are of quite a different sort that they want to point out while I'm scrolling through this very, very lengthy chat box. That could be Cal, it could be Cody, um, it could be Jackie. I don't want Cal to ask any question because I think it's gonna to be too hard for me. He, he's the, you gotta understand he's the real expert here. So I'm on, I'm on thin ice with Cal Menace. Okay, we'll permanently mute Cal, that's fine. No problem there. <laughs> Uh, here's an interesting one. Does does the book or your research address um, the the perspective of, of from the state party level? Do, do you at all look at the degree to which state parties either support or don't support rural, both economically but particularly their local committees? Does that have an impact for what you see? Uh not really. We talk a little bit about candidate recruitment for state legislative offices, which is often uh, a state party function. Um, so we talk a little bit about that, and not so much, to be honest. Which is a, which is a shame because I cut my teeth in state state party politics, right? I cut my key, teeth in New York state politics. Um, not so much. Okay, I'll make this the last one because we're definitely a little over time. And and I'll say again, thanks to everybody who participated. Um, and thanks so much to Dan for this. Uh, Vicki asks the question, is there a way to divide and conquer regarding the 90% less engaged non-rabble rousers? In other words, can we reach them in a way that's more effective and stop trying to focus on the 10% that are probably not reachable? I think it's incumbent upon the media, on reporters to better appreciate this rabble rouser phenomena. I really do. I think this is a big finding. When they go out to get the story and the story is the rabble rouser, you might think even the rural resident will say, oh, well, holy cow, I guess maybe I missed that or maybe I should be a little bit more churned up about that, right? There's this thing called risk, risk shift phenomena where if you are part of a group that's intense, you naturally become more intense yourself. So maybe there's this, there's this sense that, wow, I really should be more engaged, more, more revved up about this, about this, this small piece of the issue than I am. I think it's incumbent upon reporters to get that right, to not simply knock on the door with the posters. Uh, you know, and as I said, it's maybe less dramatic, but it's more accurate, right? It's more accurate. Go, go next time. Go to a, a house that doesn't have a big yard sign. <laughs> yeah, that's a less sexy story from their point yeah. of view. I guess yeah. it's not going to get people on our side fired up. Yeah. All right. So thank you again, Dan. Thanks for going a little long, and to all the participants who stayed with us. Again, I'll remind you that um, this is part of Ruby's monthly briefing series, some of the best people in the country. And next month, in the first Wednesday of April, we'll have a presentation by Ruby's own sage, Ellington Lawrence. 
And it's a lot about what Sage found in a uh, kind of deep dive into the questions around the rural urban divide, but also specifically about um, what alienates and might bring back rural people to uh, a more liberal or progressive agenda. So again, thanks to everybody for this. We will make the recording um, we will make the recording available, probably will be the end of this week or Monday. It'll be up on the Ruby website that was in the chat. And we will also, of course, that will include all of Dan's slides. Please feel free to reach out to us and to Dan. Everyone take care. Thanks.